Hi everyone, it's your boy Zach, and I'm very, very excited. Uh, so it's Stamp Talk. So uh, I just launched this Jawbreakers Lost Souls Remastered Indiegogo campaign two days ago. It's doing great. Uh, we're at uh, 21,557 backers. Um, this is the book that came out last year, and I just fulfilled it a couple days ago, um, but a lot of people missed out on it. So bringing it back for about three weeks. You can get the book with the uh, pinup for 25. You can get two books and two pinups in a box for 40. And that's a real good deal for international backers because the postage for two books is pretty much the same as the postage for one. And that's going off the realities of international postage these days. But this is one I'm very, very excited about. This one, the OG, which was the first printing, the first edition. I just printed out all the postage. I'm gonna take about two hours to pack it into the Gemini mailers, and it's going out. All 50 of them are going out today. Just to reiterate, this Indiegogo campaign started on Saturday. This tier sold out on Saturday, and the perks, the 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 book, and the four pinups are being mailed out today. Two days later, this is as far as I know unprecedented. The uh, the other tiers are going to um, go to the printer basically the day after the uh, campaign ends on uh, May 11th. So go check that out. So anyway, yesterday I did a video uh, about how basically the comic book industry is like Mean Girls. It's all this. Yeah, uh, you know, someone was saying, yeah, "You and Ethan don't understand the industry." No, we understand it really well. That's why. <laughs> We don't want to be in your little community, which is just a fear-induced uh, uh, poverty initiative. I don't know. Uh, but um, so it's basically saying, you know, look at your life. If you're out there, if you're a comic book artist, uh, professional, because back in the day, you know, anyone watch a sitcom from the 50s and 60s? They always got the bit... Oh, the big boss is coming over. Oh, we got to have the turkey, right? Oh, the turkey's a chicken, but he's allergic. You know what? You got to impress your boss. You got to kiss a little ass. Um, uh, so uh, one of the big things right now is uh, uh, comic book industry shrinking for three years. Almost every metric going down. The only one it didn't go down in, uh, it went up lower than the rate of inflation, which is sad. Um but then there's this very, very rigid political ideology. You either have to actively agree with it or you have to be utterly silent. And even then, sometimes your silence is suspicious. There's a, there's whisper networks. Uh, there are, uh, as far as I could tell, about three of them, but they all kind of share information. And these things are constant, constantly. Oh, this guy said this. Maybe he thinks this of this. Oh, this is this, this. It, it's high school. Uh, but basically what I said is I go, you know, 10, 20 years ago, you could kiss ass, you could keep your mouth shut, and you could have a career. And a career was having a book, you know, being on a, on a book for two or three years. You finish your run, maybe you have a graphic novel, maybe you have a mini series, maybe, maybe you're so popular you can just live off of doing cover assignments. But that's all pretty much gone. Right now, a career is two or three issues a year, a couple of variant covers, and that's basically it. And those are for people who are in good with the editors, who have never displeased them. These 26-year-olds who make $42,000 and you're pushing 50 and your whole life is based around kowtowing to them. So I basically said, you know, um, think, is this where you want your life to be at 40, at 50, at 60? You got no savings. You got no stability. You have people that are allies, not friends, so they will turn on you and excommunicate you. Again, one of the reasons SJWs made up this idea of community is because community is exclusive. Community is discriminatory. You can kick people out of a community. You can't kick people out of an industry. They try to conflate their sub-community with the industry. The industry is, do you make money off of anything related to comics? You're in the industry. Uh, they try to say, oh, you're not in the industry. So I'm saying, you know, if you're on the right side of history and you're in with the cool kids and, and everyone likes you, but they're not putting food on your table, who cares if they don't like you? What are they going to do? Take the food that they didn't put off, you know, put on your table off of it? Um, 
So I was, I was talking to one pro and he brought up something I kind of forgot about. And he says, you know, there's actually not a lot of incentive to do a monthly book because the pay is pretty much stagnant for the past 20 years. But the expectation on quality and detail is has never been higher. Um, and one of the reasons is they took inkers out. So for people who don't know what inkers are, let me see if this is uh, short enough so I don't get demonetized. Move this down. Add depth and shading to give the image more definition. Only then does the drawing truly take shape. So, uh, there's been different ways of you know making comics over 80 plus years, but traditionally it's something like this. The writer will either write a full script or write a Marvel style script where you just kind of vaguely describe the story and maybe say on this page this happens and then the uh, penciler gets to decide to break it into um, what panel. So this is a splash page, yes. When you used to open the front page of a comic, there was a giant dynamic picture that would draw you in, not just a bunch of text and then two pages of ads and then a bunch of flat shots. This is how every comic basically began. So if you look at this, you can see what it used to be. Now, if you, you know, you look at things and you say, oh, it's so you're just tracing over the lines. But no, 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 no. You're adding a lot. So, like, for instance, let's look at this woman who's very kind of sketchily uh drawn you can see there's no actual you know there's no actual like shading or hatching it's just like she's got this headdress on and there will kind of be folds here or there she's got a uh, clothes on i haven't really defined them vaguely bathing suit-esque and then you see uh the uh the anchor who was who was it oh in this case john pusima did both <laughs> so this is a bad example oh my gosh uh but well no you can see he's wearing two different hats he's basically putting down you know a, a, a vague uh blueprint but then you go in there and you actually do all of the the shading the hatching the cross hatching then you actually add in the detail there's some sort of lace on the bodice the um, you know, just barely putting in a face in right there and uh, then really defining it in the expression, the color of hair and everything like that. So what it used to be now, usually back in the day, it was usually two different people. Um, there was a couple reasons for that. You know, uh, you could you could get more books and make more money if you're able to do a couple books. Jack Kirby would do sometimes three, four five books in a month. And if you had a strong enough style like John Buscema did, he could hand this off to uh, Tom Palmer or uh, Joe Sinet, and they would add their own style onto it. But then they would also, you know, show off his style. You, you, you were never confused whether it was John Buscema or not. Uh, but now, even though I kind of stepped on my my thesis, where it's like, oh, this is the same. So basically, what I'm saying is. Um, Right now, if you notice, there's very few inkers in comics, and usually it is the penciler inking himself. Now, if you are a master like John Buscema, you can do that. Um, but for the average person, these are kind of two different skill sets. Penciling is, is, is um, about form, you know, and uh, the composition, whereas the inking is about depth. You know, the, the classic trick to do is that... Um, Thicker lines towards the front of the camera, thinner lines towards the back. And then you kind of you kind of pick and choose where you want to put detail. As you notice, there's a fair amount of detail in here. But if you look closely, not really. There's nothing really on this shirt. There's no seams. Um, everything's kind of like swimsuit-esque on the women. And the guy's, quote, clothing is fairly just like, you know, tights it just kind of conforms to his body then he'll put like a little detail on this but again this stuff right here this whatever jug of wine and vague i don't know oranges apples you can see it gives the impression of okay you know back in the day and this is the palace you know they would have the grapes but he didn't really draw grapes he just drew a bunch of quickly drawn circles and uh some kind of decanter or something like this um, it also lets him know, like, uh, hey, I know that the uh, the title of the, God, look 
how beautiful that is. That's hand drawn. The warrior and the werewoman. And, but he knows that this is going to be kind of a dead space, so you see he doesn't waste his time uh, drawing much there at all. And then when he got it back from the letterer, he didn't have to do anything. This is, you know, what are 10% of the real estate of this page, and he just gets to not do anything. But nowadays, that doesn't happen. They turn in the digital, usually, okay, so during the Quesada era, they started doing digital inks. Digital inks were not inks. They were, for the most part, pencils that were scanned, and then they would adjust the levels in uh, Photoshop. Basically, you know, make the, the gray of the pencil look uh, uh, darker, kind of more like inks. And then you can do, like, multiply layers, so that will kind of... It's like putting multiple transparencies on top of each other. It'll kind of like fatten up the line and, and, and make it stand out more. It's, it'll be looking more like an inked line. They never really looked. Digital inks never looked like ink. They looked like digital inks. So then what they started doing is digital inks kind of went away. Um, and what we got was uh, people... Okay, so this is going to be confusing. Digital inks were replaced by digitally inked. By that means you take out a stylus, you know, I've got a Surface Pro here, or you got a Wacom or whatever, and then you draw it either on paper and you scan it or you draw it on the, you know, tablet, and then you would trace over it in a, in a digital ink. You know, basically you would use a, the brush, you'd go from the, the pencil tool on the Photoshop, and then you would go to the brush tool. Now, those were good to varying qualities. The problem is that We've kind of broken. There's a whole tradition that was basically lost. The last real inkers came up in the 90s, the end of the 90s. Then we had 10 years of digital inks. We lost a generation. And now it's pencilers who don't understand what penciling is. And they think, or they don't understand what inking is. So they just go over the line. If you noticed, a lot of, there's kind of like this coloring book style to um, inking now where nothing pops out, everything seems flat, and it's just like, okay, you do the fill, you know, you know, the paint bucket tool here. But um, this was really, really crucial, and it existed from the 1930s until basically about 15, 16 years ago with Casada, and then it got broken. And this is why, um, number one, you can't do monthlies because people are expected to, to ink themselves. And unless you're a master with a brush and you know what to concentrate and want to just, you know, okay, well, I'm not going to draw all these leaves. It's just going to be a silhouette and we'll draw a moon there. So, you know, uh, you know, it's a uh, nighttime. Um, unless you're a master like John Buscema, it's going to crush you. So that's one of the reasons, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of reasons we don't see runs. A run is when, you know, Dale Keown takes over as the, penciler and sometimes the inker of Incredible Hulk and then he draws it for like two years with a couple fill-ins by other artists here or there. You don't get runs. Number one, they don't want to give too much power to an artist. They're still, geez, 28 years later, they are still broken hearted. You know, when the image crew left them high and dry, they don't ever want an artist to become that powerful or that popular. Um, when someone starts getting that popular, they'll just stop hiring them or they'll just put them on a couple of prestige books, which kind of brings them out of, you know, that monthly thing. But, but then they basically, to get a job, you have to be super detailed, but when you're super detailed, you don't have the speed to get it done on time. So that's why you get like three in a row. We saw this with the return of Wolverine. They only had Steve McNiven on the first and last issues. And then they had just, who is it? Declan Shalvey just, throwing stuff out there because he's got a quick style but this one is huge you know and you know changa you got all the pieces you remove the one you think is not important they removed the one they thought was not important and basically the industry collapsed you need to bring back inkers bring inkers allow the pencilers to put in more detail while also hitting a monthly uh schedule when you have the same crew on for years and years and years, you build loyalty. Sometimes Peter David would be on some dumb subplot or maybe a couple, you know, uh, you know, I, actually, I think I liked all of the 
the plots and subplots during uh, his his uh, run with Dale Keown. But sometimes they'll get into a little bit. You go, I, I don't really like this storyline. But you like the one before. It's the same artist. It's the same writer. It's the same inker. It's the same color. So you're like, yeah, there's still little bits I like. I'm going to stay on it. Now, you know, it's there's no consistency. The only real consistency is those people who put Amazing Spider-Man on their pull list because those people put that book on their pull list in freaking 1995 and they don't take it off till they die. That is the most diehard loyal fan base there is, Amazing Spider-Man. They will buy a book for 10 years without liking it, or at least they'll pay for it. I don't know if they'll actually read it. Um, but anyway, that's a, a, oh, so I forgot one thing because I had the bad luck to pick um, uh, you know, uh, one where he actually inked himself. So one of the big things that happened, especially during the, the Conan, the barbarian and King Conan and, uh, Cull the conqueror is that, you know, mostly John Buscema, he was the guy to do that. But then they would start sending out, they found a bunch of very, very good artists in the Philippines. So they started doing this thing called finishing and em embellishing. If you think this is loose and this is just barely a, a blueprint, you haven't seen how loose pencils can be when you get a finisher and an embellisher. So the deal about being an inker is you should be able to draw, but technically you don't have to. You just under, you really need to understand about depth and a little bit about shading. Um, but to be a finisher or embellisher, you actually do have to be able to draw. So what the embellisher would do is, and you got to track down any of the, the Conan, Red Sonia, any of those 70s and 80s era, they would... Uh, Send the, the pencils or probably, you know, a photostat of them off to the Philippines. And they, would, they wouldn't just ink it. They would effectively draw every single thing all over. And there was tons of detail. Like, when they drew the grapes, they would be grapes, not just ovals. And they would have the little stem. They would have the, the branch. You would be able to tell that this was a orange or an apple, not just generically something. Uh, I mean, this woman, she would have a chainmail bikini and they would draw every single piece of the chainmail. This guy would have all of these things on his belt. I mean, it's just beautiful. So, and again, that allows John Bus Busima, a popular artist with a recognizable style to do three, four books a month, make that extra money and still be monthly. So anyway, uh, thanks for watching. Subscribe, make sure you're still subscribed. Hit the bell for notifications. Thanks to everyone giving to the GoFundMe and the Indiegogo. Man, for y'all who got this tier, I'm I'm blowing my own mind. You back this on Saturday and I'm mailing it on Monday and is this even my life? Anyway, thanks for watching and I'll have a new comic review up later tonight. Thanks, bye.